Let's go. Hi, Dave. Hi, Claire. How are you doing? Good. No, no thumbs up. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, I don't have an actual giant foam finger behind me, sadly. But yes, two giant orange uh, figurative thumbs up. Now, I feel like at least from my end of things, your shirt does not look orange. It looks coral. Is that true? It's 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 a it's not my standard likable orange, okay. but it okay. is uh it is or I would say orange. Okay, so maybe salmon. Mm, Could see, be salmon. Mm, salmon is a different color, but okay. But you should know, I'm still wearing orange shoes as always. It's as just always. extremely difficult on Skype for me to actually Have show you those shoes without looking really ridiculous. Right. And the last thing you would want to do is look ridiculous. Um. Okay, I'm going to read your bio for folks who don't already know everything about you. Uh, Dave Kirpin is the co-founder and chairman of Likeable Media, an award-winning social media and word-of-mouth word marketing firm, and the founder and CEO of Likeable Local, a software platform for small businesses. Dave and his wife, Carrie, lead two teams of over 75 people in working with brands, organizations, governments, and small businesses to better leverage social media to become more transparent, responsive, engaged, and likable. Likeable Media was named to both the 2011 and 2012 Inc. 500 list of fastest growing private companies in the United States and to both the 2012 and 2013 Crane's Best Places to Work in New York, number six in 2013. Dave is a frequent keynote speaker at venues around the world and a contributing writer for LinkedIn, Mashable, Inc., Fast Company, The Huffington Post, Forbes, and The Washington Post. Whew. His work has been featured on CNBC's On the Money, ABC World News Tonight, the CBS Early Show, BBC World News, and the New York Times, among others. Dave is proud of his likable business accomplishments, but prouder of his other joint venture with Carrie, their three kids at home in Port Washington, New York. And your, we were just discussing one of your children just turned 13 yesterday, an exciting, an exciting age. Sounds terrible. Very exciting. Look, I've got a, I've got a very exciting range because I've got now a teenager and a, an infant. Um, <laughs> so there's not a ton of people that have both a teenager and an infant at home and then one in, one in, one in the middle. And it's, and it's like even worse next year because next year you have a teenager and a toddler. That's, yes. that's sad, Dave. <laughs> so I hear. <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. So can you kind of tell us a little bit more about how, how you, you got here where you are? I don't know if you want to include the reality television part of the journey or not, but but you can. Um, well, since you mentioned that, I will. I don't know, but I'll, I'll I'll try to do the relatively quick story. I mean, it's a fantastic, crazy story. Um, you know, I met my uh, I was working at Disney in sales after I graduated from uh, college, and I was actually the number one salesperson in the country until this woman started working at my office. Uh, she dropped me to number two um, fairly quickly. I fell madly in love with her, obviously, because if you can't beat them, join them. And um, uh, I wanted to, I knew right away I wanted to marry this woman and go into business with her. Uh, there was a slight problem. She was married already. So uh, she ended up moving to New York uh, with her husband to focus on her marriage. I did what anyone with unrequited love would do. I went on a reality TV show to find true love, a really sleazy show on Fox called Paradise Hotel. Which I watched Sexy in singles. college. Sexy singles at a luxury resort and me uh, made for some very funny and entertaining television. Um, after Paradise Hotel, I was living in Los Angeles, D-list celebrity. Um, I hadn't talked to Carrie in over a year, and uh, but I missed her. So out of the blue from the American Music Awards in 2003, I called Carrie and I said, hey, Carrie, I'm hanging out on the red carpet, kind of trying to show off. I was like, what are you doing? She said, I'm actually at home. I'm um, going through a divorce now. I said, I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> and um, I hopped on a plane, I moved, uh, uh, went to New York, we started dating, I fell in love with her a second time and um, it went, uh, it was much smoother that time around and <laughs> we ended happens. up getting engaged um, and we had, uh, we both had a very strong sales and marketing background um, but we didn't have enough money to pay for the wedding of our dreams. I really wanted to get married uh, in a large venue, I'm kind of a larger than life type personality and I wanted to be able to invite all my friends and family and so we ended up, we had an idea and we ended up partnering with a minor league baseball team, the Brooklyn Cyclones and affiliate of the Mets and we created a sponsored wedding promotion called Our Field of Dreams and we got married at the end of a baseball game in front of um, 500 friends and family and 5,000 strangers uh, and it, the event was awesome. We ended up generating about $100,000 in sponsorship revenue from our wedding vendors slash sponsors and $20,000 for charity. And the event was awesome because uh, I got married to the love of my life on a baseball field. But 
It was also a very successful marketing event. We generated just a ton of media, a ton of social media back then in 2006. Um, blogs were all the rage. Um, and our wedding vendors, including 1-800-Flowers.com, who had sponsored our flowers, and Entenmann's, who had sponsored our desserts, said, you know, this was awesome, Dave and Carrie. What are you guys going to do next? And we couldn't get married again, so we started a company instead. And that company was Likeable Media. It's grown to become one of the fastest growing, uh, largest now independent social media agencies in the country, um, working with just some of the world's biggest brands, GE, uh, Verizon, Johnson & Johnson, 1-800-Flowers.com, Seamless Grubhub, um, uh, U.S. Bank, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, but three years ago, I became increasingly passionate about working with small businesses. Hmm. Um, I had written a book that's been very successful called Likeable Social Media. Um, but it's one thing to read a book. It's another thing to actually make something work for you day in, day out. Um, and small businesses really struggle with social media and being able to make social media work for them. So um, I took everything I, we had learned uh, working with big brands over at Likeable Media and we put it into a software platform to help small businesses automate and manage their social media presence. And that, that second company is called Likeable Local and we've been at that for just about three years now. Um, and we have thousands of small business customers. So uh, that's really my major focus now, although my wife continues to be focused on our first company. And um, we've been very, very blessed. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, in the bio, 75 staff people were now over 100 uh, combined. So, um, uh, and best places to work in, you mentioned 2012 and 2013, but I have to update that bio. It was also 2014 and 2015 best places to work. Well, so did you notice? Actually- did you notice, though, I did update the bio with the number of children? I knew to make you that did. change. You did. No, I appreciated <laughs> that clear. Sometimes people mess up that. Uh, that's, that's the key. The most important <laughs> growth statistic is that one of my organizations grew by 25% last year, namely the family. So yes, you are right about that. But actually, in terms of professional accomplishments, that's probably the proudest accomplishment is, is being named to the best places to work hmm. in New York for four, four straight years because to me, you know, workplace culture is really, really important. And, and um, you know, I think that's, that's kind of the, the sign that, that we're building something, something good. Hmm. So I want to I want to start by asking you a question kind of about this idea of 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 being good to your customers, right? So you have this quote in likable social media where you say if you want to grow a social presence, you have to take the time and energy to attract the low-hanging fruit, your current customers and other people who know you. From there, you'll gain other fans and followers who are likely to eventually buy from you, but you have to start with your current customers. So most of us when we think about how to use social media to be successful and to grow profit. We just focus on how we can get people to know about us. And we don't even think about the people who already do know about us. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a big challenge because people, especially in starting off businesses, want to use social media to, to launch something, to get the word out. But it's like, you know, it's, it's like any brand, if it's brand new and nobody knows about you, how are you going to get them to trust you in the first place? Whereas you, you, everyone out there, even if you're literally just starting a business, has people that they do know and that already tr- know, know, like, and trust them. And the thing is, social media, I, I think about as word of mouth on steroids. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to start the word of mouth somewhere, and why not start the word of mouth with your existing customers, or if you're frankly absolutely brand new, with your existing uh, social network, if you will, your existing circle of, of influence, your existing friends and family, because it, it's so much harder to change uh, someone's mind that has no idea who you are than somebody that already uh, does business with you at least, or if not, at least or already knows, likes, and trusts you, or the friends of the people that know, like, and trust you already. Hmm. So when you go in and you're working with a small business, say, right, and the small business says, we really need to increase our reach and we've got like no one on Facebook following us, so how are we going to even get started? What would you say to them? Yeah, so we immediately, I immediately would say, I would say, uh, do you have an email list of your customers? Give me your email list of your cu- current customers and upload it to Facebook and then run Friends of Connections ads and run ads targeting the friends of the people that are your existing customers. The amazing thing about Facebook advertising, it's ridiculous, is the built-in social context. I mean, if I said to you, you could take out a billboard where the billboard changed with the name of the person the name of the friend of the person that was driving by every time a different person drove by and said, I like these guys, 
Like, or imagine you could take out a radio ad and every single radio ad was different depending on the, na- on, on the person that was listening. And in the radio ad, you know, every single person heard their own personalized version of three of your friends, including Claire, like this business. That would be like the most compelling form of, of advertising possible. But obviously that's not possible with TV or radio or print or billboards or any other form of advertising. That exact kind of advertising, that social context, that built-in word of mouth is possible right now with Facebook. So it, it's about getting your existing customers, friends, to see the built-in endorsement from their own friends of your business. And, and that's a, an extremely, extremely powerful concept. And it's interesting because that whole idea of you know everything you're talking about right now also brings up sort of this concept that online these days we're all sort of in a fishbowl. So it's how we how we treat our customers is kind of seen by by the rest of the world. And you have this other line in one of your books where you say um, it's important to think of every customer as an online celebrity with followers, friends, and above all, influence. And it seems like that kind of relates to that idea. Yeah. Look, I mean, if if, um, if uh, Justin Bieber walked into your store. If you, had a, if you had a retail location, you would probably take pretty darn good care of him. Or if you're in e-commerce, if Justin Bieber sent you an email saying, you know, hey, I'm interested in this product. Well, you know, the truth is everyone has influence to one extent or another now online. And, um, you know, if you treat every customer well, um, you're going to uh, uh, increase your odds of those customers sharing with their friends. Obviously, the average person on Facebook has a few hundred friends. The average person on LinkedIn has a couple hundred uh, connections. The average person on Twitter has a couple hundred followers. And then some, some of your customers and prospects might have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of, of connections or followers. So your impact on one potential customer or, frankly, one potential conversation is so much more thanks to social media now. Do you think, I'm, I'm curious, especially working with sort of small businesses, you work with small businesses, or if you're talking about sort of like entrepreneurs that maybe just have kind of a few a few contractors who worked with them, I think there's this tendency these days to just focus on like the sale and not really thinking about like the customer follow-up or even customer service at all. I mean, do you, yeah. do you see that with your clients? Yeah, I, I see that a lot, and I see that, frankly, with our competitors in the small business space, too, and it's all about uh, acquiring customers, and um, the thing is, the, the, the long tail of a business success is not going to be customer acquisition, it's going to be uh, customer retention, and uh, it's much, much less expensive to retain a customer than it is to get a new customer, um, and the upsell and cross-sell opportunities are tremendous if you uh, treat your customers well and retain them, but so many folks... Uh, don't pay attention to that. They're always thinking about the new customers, and uh, um, it's really a tragedy. And it's not the way. It's not. It's not a good way to do business. I, I will. I have a major competitor to 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 my software company that will remain nameless, but <laughs> that um, that churns at about nine percent a month. They lose nine percent of their customers every single month. Well, the 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 expense of of replacing those customers and still trying to grow is ridiculous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Why not cut your churn down, you know, build your product, build your service to the point where you can keep your customers, your existing customers happy. It just seems to me that's a much, much better way to, to do business. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. There's um, kind of this, this other thing I want to ask you about. So in your latest book that came out just a few months ago, when did The Art of People come out? Art of People came out uh, yeah, two months ago, and I just so happened to have uh, a, a – I think I've told you about this. You know, When you show the cover of a book, it makes you about 10x more likely to sell that book than when you do not show – Really? So this is actually the UK cover. Well, I was going to say, that's not my cover at all. <laughs> this is – because I know you have some international folks. This is the UK cover that – People seem to like this cover better than the it's orange really cool uh, cover. U- U.S. cover. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's doing very well internationally. So, uh, yeah, The Art of People is my newest book, but I interrupted you. You were saying. Well, there's this really funny story in The Art of People that I kind of, as I was reading it, I, I couldn't help but wondering, like, if you, if you, you know, at the last minute thought maybe you should edit it out or not. Um, but it kind of has to do with this idea of pricing, Right. And so I think pricing is really challenging for particularly new entrepreneurs or, you know, small business entrepreneurs who have some type of service or something that 
it's not necessarily a service, but just something they're not quite sure how to price on, right? So you have this story about you basically bluffing on your monthly rate to a potential client, right? Which is yeah. amazing and not something, you know, people admit to or whatever. And it like totally worked to your benefit, right? So kind of talk us, tell me the story kind of from this perspective of what you were like when you were at the stage when you were bluffing and and what it could mean to someone who's sort of more just getting started these days. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, it has, you have to really be able to price your services based on what you're worth. And if you can't do that, you're going to be really stuck. Um, and I, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs just starting out um, end up really limiting themselves because because of pricing and because of saying yes to things that uh, will limit them. And uh, the story I tell in the book is about this uh, this uh, business owner named Charlie. Uh, he owned a, a restaurant in, in Astoria, Queens, a Greek restaurant, and he just he wanted everything for nothing. And uh, like so many of us, you know, have to deal with clients that do that. And and um, you know, I basically you know held firm. I said, look, you know, I can't uh, do this business at at uh, the rate that you want to you want to do it, and um, you know, I'm I'm willing to walk if uh, you can't pay the 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 the, the amount that I, I know I'm worth. And uh, of course, he came down. He you know he came, he came back up and 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 and, and took the business. Um, and eventually, actually, I I ended up uh, firing him. Even now, that's kind of another story. But you, I, you fired uh, him. You were the, I fired yeah. him because mm-hmm. as we were, I mean, even even at its best, it was not enough for what I wanted to do. Um, I you know I don't remember the particulars. I think he wa- he wanted to pay me like two hundred dollars a month or something, and 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 I ended up getting five hundred dollars a month. But soon thereafter, I mean, we were working with much bigger clients and much bigger dollars, and and I knew that by by doing. By working for him, I was keeping, I was holding myself back and holding our company back, and so we ended up um, hmm. saying goodbye to him. And you know, one thing that's really, really important along the same lines as pricing for your value is, is is thinking about what you can say no to. And really, the more that you say no to, the more you say no to the wrong things. I like to say, the more you say no to the wrong things, the the the, the more opportunities you'll have to say yes to the right things. And you know, Charlie went away for five hundred dollars a month, but. You know, dozens of much bigger companies with much bigger budgets came our way, and uh, it was hard, especially as someone that years later is super passionate and driven to help small businesses. But the thing is, if if you're selling services, you have a very you know there's a defined limit to the amount of time that you have. So it's it's there, there's a real challenge there. And if you're going to build a business, you have to um, price yourself accordingly. And if you're gonna if you're gonna grow, and then mm-hmm. you're gonna have to say no to some folks. So I want to dig into that a little bit more. You have another quote from one of your books where you say um, it's kind of this idea of like on staying this idea of staying true to yourself, which seems very related to making sure you're not saying yes to the wrong things. You say the lesson here is clear. Stay true to yourself and you'll give you'll give your organization more opportunities in the long run. Stray from your true self and you'll risk out on not only losing yourself, but losing your organization's strengths as well. Talk to me about this because it seems like it's spot on with what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think it's both about both focus um, and authenticity, right? So uh, early on in um, in our first business, we had a, a, my wife sort of. We now laugh about it, but um, people would ask us uh, if they do, if we do X, and pretty much whatever X was, we'd say, "Yeah, we we do that, sure." Oh. Um, and then they'd say, um, "Oh, what do you charge for X?" And I'd say. Well, how much do you have? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so we basically did anything for any amount of money, yeah. and that was really, really bad. Like <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's really bad for many reasons. But the lack of focus um, and the lack of staying true to, to you know, to, to your original point, the lack of staying true to who you are, um, it's no good. And the more we focused yeah. over time, okay, this is what we're really good at. This is what we're all about. This is what we know we can be great at. This is what we know. Um, we can build an organization uh, uh, with and, and build teams with, et cetera. Um, you know, that's when we've really taken off in both businesses. It's like when, when you're trying to do too many things, you just, you, you can't pot. How could you be true to yourself? Like there's no one out there that can do everything. So just figure out what it is that you really are great at and passionate about 
and believe in. And that's the intersection of what you can, you know, you should be selling and building. Hmm. So how does this play into, okay, because I think that this advice is amazing. I think when people hear this advice, though, they think it's only relevant to once you're successful. So they think maybe it's only relevant to you sitting here with 100 employees, right? So tell me yeah. why it's so important yeah. back when back when you needed the $500 from the Greek restaurant or whatever. The opposite is true. I mean, the opposite is truly the case, Claire. You, you can't get to that point where you're successful unless you say no to the wrong thing. You know, for $500 a month, Charlie was asking me to pass out flyers through Queens. Like, <laughs> I, I couldn't build a social media empire if I was passing out flyers through Queens. It just, I, I literally couldn't have done it. So you, you just, it's really, I, I have to, I have to sympathize with it, with anyone out there to your point that is thinking, you know, F Dave, like he's already successful. Like I got to do this. I got to pay the bills. I have to tell you, I totally sympathize and saying no to cash when I was building a business and had no health insurance and had a child, like that was the hardest thing I have ever done professionally for many years mm -hmm. until ve raising venture capital funding. But that's another, another story. But, but that was really, really hard to say no to cash in the door. Like I totally sympathize with anyone out there that's saying I can't do it. But I'll, I will quote my daughter Kate's dance teacher that that word is a curse word that she never wants to hear that C word. Yep. There's a four letter C word. There's a four letter C word. Starts with C and ends in NT. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people mm -hmm. think it's another four letter C word. Mm -hmm. But that's not my mm -hmm. word. My mm -hmm. word is can't. Don't say can't. When you say can't, you limit yourself immediately. If you're out there thinking, I can't say no to flyering in Queens, you're dead wrong. Not only can you say no to flyering in Queens, you have to say no to flyering in Queens. You have to say no to things that are going to pull you off focus, to things that are going to eat up your time, to things that are going to suck your mental energy. You absolutely have to say no and you have to figure out a way to get to the yeses, to get to the cash that's actually real money that's going to help you grow versus keep you stuck and keep you miserable. You have to. I love it. I love it. So is this something you remind yourself to do on a daily basis these days or is it something you now know how to do? Yes and yes. I know how to do it, but it's still a constant reminder. You know, it, and, it, and the stakes just get higher. My wife, mm. you know, my wife is really, she runs that, she runs that business, okay? Mm. And, I, and I, I don't interfere with our first business. And they're, they're, they're making wonderful money. But she had a customer that was paying, I, I, I can say, I just won't say the customer. They were paying $50,000 a month, mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. for what it is that we actually do. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful client. And they wanted some work that isn't stuff that we focus on. They mm -hmm. wanted like a website, okay? We don't do websites. They were willing to pay $50,000, an extra, just for a website, one-time fee. But guess what? If you take that $50,000, mm -hmm. then you have staff people working on a website. Then you have mental energy figuring out how to do a website when that's not what you do. Uh, is it still hard at this time in my life to say no to $50,000? Of course. But you have to keep reminding yourself, no matter what, the stakes may have changed, but the rules remain the same. Say no to everything that's off focus and say yes to everything that, that, that is, is, is on focus. And know the difference. The stakes may have changed, but the rules remain the same. Love it. True, true story. Whether whether you've never you know driven a, a dollar of revenue before, um, uh, and you, and you're watching this thinking, okay, how do I build a business? What do I what do I do? Like the answer is not everything. <laughs> the answer is not everything. The answer is what is the you know what is the most narrowly defined thing that you can do mm -hmm. that's going to make you money. Mm -hmm. Can you tell people what you're really working on right now and where folks can find more about you? So I, I, say, I mentioned, of course, that responsiveness is one of my core values. So I, I, I get hundreds of comments and questions every single week and I respond to every one. So I'm very into that. I love the challenge. I only sleep three to four hours a night. So people, if they have any questions, comments, anything, can hit me up on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Uh, just Google likable uh, or uh, Dave Kerb in my name and you can, you can chat with me. And, uh, you know, of course, The Art of People is my newest book. You can check it out. 
And then if you happen to be a small business, uh, you can check out Like of a Local, our software for small businesses. But uh, it's been a great pleasure. I hope that folks can get a little something out of this. And um, I encourage people to continue the conversation uh, anytime. Thank you so much, Dave. This was great. My pleasure.